Thank you. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I've been asked to set the context for the panel discussion, and I'll do so uh, using some of the experience and things we're doing at CUSP in New York City, which is now four and a half years old. Um, I'd like to start with a pitch for cities as a venue for data science. There are a number of aspects that recommend this as one of the primo areas in which to develop and apply data tools. One is that cities matter. Most of the people in the world now live in cities. A growing fraction by mid-century will have 70% in cities. In the US, 80% of us live in urban areas. So if you want to change society, cities are the place you need to start. The second is I'll show you the data are plentiful and diverse. And that's being driven by the digitization of all manner of records, the open data movement that Sarah referred to both at the municipal, state, and importantly at the federal level. And then there are all kinds of sensors that are being developed and deployed to provide other kinds of data about the cities. And this is a relatively unplowed field. There are things to do. It is not a mature field of science. We have activities we need to do to develop and refine the methods and technologies to acquire, integrate, and exploit the data that we have. There's a science of cities to do, to compare different cities and understand the regularities across space, across time, among cities, uh, and of course the anomalies, which are always interesting. And then there are a host of applications for the government, for the citizens, and then the private sector. So it's a very rich area, both intellectually as well as in terms of its implications for society. When I came out of the Department of Energy, I was the undersecretary, not the urban secretary, though I might have been uh, toward the end because I got interested in, in cities. Um, I asked myself, for various reasons, what does it mean as a scientist to try to instrument a city? And you want to know broadly about three buckets of data. You want to know about the infrastructure, its condition, its operation, the roads, the electrical grid, the sewer system, the buildings, and so on. You want to know about the environment, not only the meteorology, but pollution, noise, the flora and fauna that live in cities. There are more rats than people in New York City, for example. Boston's not too shabby either, I gather. Um, and then most interestingly, importantly, and problematically, you want to know about the people. Once you say you're going to study cities, the people are front and center because we build and operate cities for people. And if you can take off privacy for a moment, hypothetically, privacy is very important. We'll come back to that. You want to know location, state of health, nutrition, interactions, economic activity, on and on. And the underlying belief in what we and a growing number of universities are doing is that if we can properly acquire, integrate, and analyze this data, we can take the government beyond anecdotal understanding. Uh, we can make better and more efficient operations, better planning, better policy. We can improve governance and citizen engagement. If you've got access to data on how your city government is performing, that changes your relationship with the government. You can complain that your bus service is only half as good as the people across town, for example. We can enable the private sector to provide new services for citizens, government firms. Everybody wants to know what's going on in cities. Whether you're an insurance company that wants to stratify risk, you're a retail operation that wants to cite a store, or you're a political campaign that wants to target your advertising. And then finally, I think this really is changing the social sciences. I know there have been social science uh, sessions previously in this conference, uh, but as I mentioned, social science is a big part of what needs to happen in cities. There is a lot of data out there. You start making a list of the things that you have. You have the organic data flows, the kinds of data that the city generates just in the course of doing its business, whether it's tax records or 311 complaints or operational data on the transit, the utilities, the educational system. We have all manner of sensors, the sensors we carry in our pockets, but increasingly fixed sensors that are doing video, um, meteorology, you can go on and on. We have sensors at choke points, easy pass kinds of data that track vehicles. And then there are opportunities for a researcher, maybe the most interesting, to apply novel technologies 
to sense what's going on in the city in ways that have not been done before and presumably give us new information. Broadly, what one does with this information can be categorized in four modes. One is to improve efficiency, namely allocation of resources, identify outliers, those entities that are different than the others are probably doing something interesting and sometimes they're not complying with regulations. We can use this to validate and calibrate predictive models. If you put on a congestion charge, for example, what will be the effect of traffic flow? And then finally, we can use this data to assess the effects of interventions. If you made a change in policy or operations, did it achieve the effect that you wanted? Just to give you a sense of the kind of data that's out there and the granularity of it, this is federal data from the American Community Survey. It's a measure of household income inequality. The details are not important, but I want you to pay attention to the spatial resolution on which this data is available. Uh, we have dynamic data. In New York City, there are 13,000 yellow cabs. Every one of the half a million rides a day that they make is instrumented. Where did it start, stop, time, fare, tip, driver, medallion number, and so on. This is a, we have about a billion such trips in our database. And this is a cut from one year in May, three and a half million trips. You can see the number of trips from the airports in red and the train stations in green at 15 minute resolution. The tips are in the bottom, same sort of data. Uh, what's impressive is how repetitive this pattern is day after day, different on the weekends, uh, pretty much the same day by day, having to do in this case with arrivals and departures of trains and planes. This kind of pulse of the city will come back again as one of the science things we need to understand. All right, so let me talk about challenges um, rather than successes so much, though so we'll talk a, about a couple of successes. And I want to split it into education, research, and applications. I'll start with education. There's, this is a new subject. What is this subject anyway? It's some hybrid between civil engineering, data science, sociology, some of the physical sciences, and so on. If you're educating students, what's the body of knowledge you want to teach them? What's the curriculum? And you have to deal in any educational effort in this field with the diversity of backgrounds. In our CUSP class, this is the class from last year. It was our third cohort, 87, uh, 82 students. Some of them are cognitive psychologists. Other than them are data scientists, economists. You've got to bring them all up to some common level of understanding. About a third of these students were women. It's about the average in the current class. And interesting, and I'll come back to interactions with the city, seven of these students are New York City employees in the various agencies who are doing the program part time. Triple benefit for that, right? They get the education. Uh, they bring a very interesting perspective to the classroom. One of them is, was, these folks have graduated already, an active duty cop with a decade of experience in the city. And we also get a friend when they go back to their agencies, which is very important in interacting with the city. Uh, that's the curriculum. I won't go through it in detail, but it is 30% roughly data. Another 30% urban, how do cities work? What are their problems? And about 40% of a capstone project that they work on in teams. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, a little bit about challenges in the research. Fusion of cultures. Uh, I like to say in our center, we go from sensors to data scientists to sociologists or social scientists to civil servants. And you need to hook these disciplines and domains up in a productive way if you're going to have any impact at all. It is a real challenge. Uh, there are multiple cultures here, multiple ways think about people think about proofs, what a graduate student is, what a publishable paper is, and so on. And it's an ongoing challenge for us to uh, fuse these cultures. At the more technical level, the data are a challenge. Data quality, you know, some of those taxi rides start in the middle of the East River, and you've got to clone those out. Uh, not so easy when you're dealing with a billion records to do. Data volume, sensor data, compression. The sensor data is voluminous, particularly the imagery data. So you've got to do feature extraction. Data standards, not common among cities. Uh, coverage, bias, accuracy, precision, usual things. 
A very interesting one is what I like to call data hoarding. The data are in diverse hands, and I like to say that the second most basic human urge is to hoard data. Everybody does it. Right? The academics do it because you want priority in the publications. The corporations do it because it's got commercial value. And the city agencies do it because information is turf and power within the city government. So breaching those data stovepipes is a major problem. Access control, also when you're working with students, you have reason to want to control access to the data for proprietary reasons, for privacy reasons, obviously, but also infrastructure vulnerabilities. If you start putting out maps where every manhole is uh, in the city, that's not a good thing if you're worried about people making mischief with it. Um, an interesting research aspect is the fusion of sensor data and records data together. We've had some modest successes in this. We need an urban ontology. What are the entities involved? How do they relate to one another? How do they show up in the databases? Fusing multiple sensors together and upscaling high-res data in a limited area to broader areas or downscaling it is a major research challenge and the creation and validation of proxies uh, things that you can measure will tell you things you're interested in if you can get the right kind of proxies. These are familiar from remote sensing uh, data. The whole world is trying to do this thing now, whether it's three-letter government agencies, the data companies like Google, or the academic research centers. Access to municipal infrastructure is another one. If you want to put out sensors, let's say on city light poles, um, it's a big deal. Uh, there are work rules, there are all kinds of constraints, and it just makes a lot of trouble to be able to do research. Um, and then uh, a research challenge is the creation of data-driven models. What's normal? How does that physiology play out day to day? What are anomalies? How are they interesting? What do they tell you? And of course, to try to create predictive models. The state of predictive models is pretty poor. Um, one of the exercises the students did two years ago was to take a set of environmental impact studies that had been filed with the city for projects five or six years ago and looked at the predictions of those EISs against what actually happened after the building was built. And needless to say, uh, it wasn't pretty. Uh, this is a natural thing for scientists to want to do. It is hardly ever done. Uh, by the cities or the planning commissions. Um, we are building a facility. We, we have it up and running, the CUSP data facility. For those of you who are interested, the URL is up there. This is meant to be and is turning into an omnivorous repository for all manner of data about New York City. City records, sensor data, data we generate ourselves, some privately held data, access controls, interoperable, well curated, uh, and open to people who are doing research with us. Essential kind of facility if you're going to do research about cities and data. Let's see. An example of the kind of municipal data that's available, New York City established something called DataBridge. Uh, Mike Bloomberg, in the last four years of his 12-year reign, uh, decreed, and only a powerful mayor can do this, that all of the cities will federate their data in one place. Uh, this is just an example of the data that's available for enforcement. You see data from finance, housing, uh, uh, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera, all together in one place. Cities have got to do this if they're going to be able to be smart. Um, another example of some of our own data, uh, again, to show you the kind of serendipitous data that's out there. There's a Wi-Fi network of access points in Lower Manhattan along a street, about 40 of them. One of our researchers, Constantine Conta Costa, analyzed the pings on that network. You don't have to connect to the network to be registered. You just have to have your Wi-Fi turned on. It'll get your MAC address. Uh, and uh, so this is a histogram separated according to workers transients and residents, which you can do according to whether you see the same MAC address every day from 9 to 5, or you see it on the weekends only, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start to get a real-time census of what's going on in the city as more and more Wi-Fi access points get deployed. You have to have access to the data, of course, to do that. 
Uh, we're putting out sound sensors. Sound is one of the biggest issues for quality of life in New York City. I grew up in New York through high school uh, and came back about five years ago as an adult. Noise is my biggest complaint. And when I arrived, I swore I was going to get the guy who was banging the trash can at 2 AM every morning. Um, and so we started a project which has now been funded uh, by the NSF to build a set of acoustically accurate uh, microphones with their boxes deployed. Uh, there are about a uh, hundred of them that have been fabricated. About a dozen of them are deployed right now. Uh, they exfiltrate through local Wi-Fi. Uh, microphone accurate to plus or minus 2 dB. Uh, and one of the problems we faced is you're not allowed to record live video, uh, live audio on New York City streets unless you're a party to the conversation. This is a rather antiquated wiretapping law. <laughs> Surprisingly, you can, you can record video, but you may not record audio. So some of the team uh, developed a machine listening algorithm that does feature extraction. If we could just play that, uh, we go back. We go back. It's, yeah, and just play that. Um, you can hear the uh, feature extraction going on uh, and so on. And so we will not send back uh, raw audio, but just DB level and some of these features. Tremendous amount of data compression also. As I said, if you put one of these every few blocks, it's a big deal. So it, it works. All right. $100 a box. So you can easily imagine proliferating them around the city. The, the, well, the, the acronym is the Sounds of New York, as you see. Um, yeah, absolutely. Start up. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we all right. This one, un unfortunately, the video isn't playing, but we set up a video camera to watch about 1,000 buildings persistently, one frame every 10 seconds. And using the techniques of astronomy, you can understand what's going on with the lights. And interestingly, we caught a lot of plumes. So when a boiler in New York City fires up with heating oil, as is done for many of the buildings, uh, you get this big plume of black smoke coming out, soot. It doesn't last for a long time, but it's there. It is the major source of particulate pollution in the city. The environmental protection folks are ecstatic. I'm sorry we don't have the video, but you can catch these plumes in almost real time and show them where they're coming from and where they're going to. The simplest thing to do is just put this up on the web and name and shame the buildings. Um, and we may do that. There are lots of issues with doing that sort of thing. Um, another sort of sensor thing we did we took, for those of you who are physical scientists, uh, a long wave infrared hyperspectral imager. So this measures long wave infrared from 7 to 13 microns and 128 spectral channels. And what it allows you to do is detect and identify all of the chemical plumes coming out of the city in real time. And this is an example of an image on the west, taken from Hoboken, the west side of Manhattan. And it's tuned to detect Freon-22 dichlorofluoromethane, which is an ozone eater. You may not buy this chemical anymore in the US. You may not build a refrigerant system that uses it. But if you have legacy stocks or legacy equipment, you can use it for the next five or six years. So we see this haze coming out. and We can identify individual sources. And again, the environmental protection people are happy for that. Well, I really wanted to find a drug lab emitting organic solvents but we didn't quite do that. It was the wrong neighborhood to be looking in. But needless to say, the police are interested also. All right, a couple of words about challenges and applications, and I'll work out, uh, finish up. You really, if you're trying to do this as an academic institution, you're working with diverse stakeholders. Not only the usual academic folks, professors and students, you've got city agencies, corporations, and citizens, all of whom have different goals, and you've got to somehow reconcile them. The word deliverables is, and I say this as a professor for 35 years, is an unnatural act for most faculty. Um, also, faculty want to do the demo, but taking it to operational status for a city agency is not something they want to do or should be doing. And so there's the whole issue of how that happens. City budgets are thin. Uh, R&D is not something almost all cities don't do. Um, procurement rules are an issue. And the agencies are not the most forward-looking organizations. 
Most of the cusp applications that we've had come through the student capstone projects. We did 14 or 15 of these last year. We'll do another similar number this year. We have a dedicated person, a former city employee who's our liaison with multiple city agencies. We solicit eight projects from the agency starting at this time of the year. Uh, there's innumerable data sharing agreements that have to be worked out for each project. We spend a lot of time with lawyers, very frustrating. Each of the projects includes a faculty mentor and a city agency sponsor, so we know that there's some receptivity and interest on the other end. And then we archive the reports, the codes, and the data so that either the next class or some commercial entity can take it over and do something useful with it. This is just an example, a list of the uh, capstones that were executed uh, this year. Um, and uh, were out briefed at the end of July, uh, two months ago. Uh, Sarah mentioned the notion of making open data useful to all. Data poverty was one of the projects the student team did. There are about five students on a team with diverse skills. Uh, and then you can go down. It's everything from planning and quality of life to operational issues. Uh, and I see I have run out of time. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>